for some system biology for diseases group at the Marshall Medical Genetic, uh, Genetics Unit. Uh, I'll just give a little bio of you, Anais, and then you can go with your talk. Uh, so Anais mainly completed her PhD in bioinformatics in, two, in, 20, in 2007 in the Developmental Biology Institute from the ex Marshall University. And then she joined as a postdoc in Alfonso Valencia's group at the, at the Spanish National Cancer Research Center in Madrid. And then she moved to France again and joins the French National Center for Scientific Research. And however, the collaboration between her and Alfonso's group uh, continued largely and is still running today uh, that the group has joined the uh, has joined the BSc. And after eight years, uh, she joined the uh, eight years in the Marcel Mathematics Institute. She joined in 2018 the Marcel, the Marcel Medical Genetics Unit, uh, where she created the group, as I said. And her main interest are in developing computational approaches to study human diseases, mainly uh, focusing in data integration and the possible use of multi-layer and complex networks uh, for the application in particular of rare diseases and, and commodities. So thank you, Anais. Uh, uh, this is your moment. <laughs> oh, thank you very much, Ike. So that was true. <laughs> Very, very clear. Uh, so it's a pleasure to to talk today to the BSc. It was uh, last time I discussed, uh, I, I presented my work was exactly two years ago. So the idea today is to make you uh, an update of what we have been doing uh, during these two years. And um, I'm gonna discuss, so maybe we can, if somebody can mute some, because I can hear a lot of uh, noise. I don't know if it's okay for you. If somebody can mute, um, Ah, great. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm going to talk today about what we are doing around the uh, integration of multiomics data and to study rare genetic diseases. So we are a group of um, computational biology. And I think as many groups of computational biology, we are really interested in, in um, two different uh, approaches on one side to try to develop new algorithms to, to try to extract information from uh, biomedical data. And on the other side, to try to apply our approaches to better understand uh, human diseases. So on the uh, algorithmic side, uh, we are really interested in, as Iker was saying, in, in uh, the integration. The integration. Of data and, oh, I'm sorry, it's, it's very noisy in the background. Okay, so uh, I'm really interested in, in the uh, integration of uh, data and omics data in particular, and we do that uh, with using network approaches and in particular multi-layer network approaches. And more recently, we became a bit interested in the use of uh, joint dimensionality reduction approaches. So both type of approach are mainly from the unsupervised field. So we are trying to get information from biomedical data, which are not labeled. And on the application side, we focus particularly on the study of rare genetic diseases. And we're interested in that because rare genetic diseases do raise uh, specific scientific challenges. These diseases, they are highly heterogeneous uh, from a genetic and a phenotypic point of view. Uh, there are also Importantly, we have very few samples and their pathophysiology is not well understood. There are no treatments. So we think that there is something specific to do uh, in computational biology for rare genetic diseases. Okay, so today I'm gonna tell about three different stories. And for each story, I will try to show you uh, the methods and the tools we are trying to develop and, and the application we are doing to study uh, rare genetic diseases, or at least the application we plan to do to study rare genetic diseases. And the first story, uh, uh, or the first set of tools I'm going to talk about is the mining of multi-layer uh, networks. <laughs> so why are we interested in that? Um, because networks are very good a very good way to represent biological information and biological knowledge. So historically, uh, when we think about network, interactum network, we think about protein-protein interaction uh, network, which represent physical interaction between proteins that are usually experimentally uh, deciphered. We can also have other type of uh, interactions uh, taken from experiments, for instance, from the molecular complexes from co-IP experiments. But we now have access to 
many other types of biological networks and biological information. We have all the information that is stored in pathway databases. So for instance, reactome, biocarta, which is a curated information about which protein acts together to, um, in, in pathways. And importantly, um, networks can also be used to represent all the type of omics information, such as uh, any type of quantitative measurement you will have on your proteins, on your genes, you can have methods to infer networks from such type of uh, quantitative omics data. Here in, in this network, it's a very simple correlation of expression. When you compute the correlation from RNA-seq experiments, for instance, it's just a simple Pearson correlation, but you can infer networks with much more advanced uh, statistical tools and approaches. So overall, we have a lot of different networks and um, th there is a lot of data that can be represented uh, as network. And you can, what is interesting also is that you can have information there for even for the genes or the proteins that are very poorly uh, studied, uh, for which you have very poor uh, information. And the technical progresses have made all these data much more reliable. So as all these protein gene relationships are the basis of the cellular functions, the processes, overall we have access to a huge quantity of information uh, on protein uh, and, and gene cellular function. The point is that th these networks, they are very big, they are noisy, they are complex, and they are different from one to another. So how do we extract this knowledge information from these big networks? And this is what we are trying to do for a few years now, trying to, to develop algorithms and approaches uh, that rely on graph theory to extract the knowledge from large scale biological networks. And we try to, in particular, focus on, on uh, leveraging these different interaction sources. And we do that with the multiplex framework that I'm gonna talk about now. The multiplex framework is a way of seeing finally your different interaction sources as layers of one biological network, which will share the same nodes. So you have exactly the same nodes in the different layers, but edges be belonging to different uh, interaction categories. And this is interesting because it's very different from merging all your network into one big network, because doing so, doing the multi complex uh, framework, you keep track of the individual network features and topology. You do not just mix everything. And so our main interest was to try to extend classical network analysis algorithms so they can uh, use these different uh, uh, interaction sources organized in a multiplex network. So we did, for instance, clustering and, and random work with restart algorithm that I'm going to talk about now. So first, clustering algorithm. So clustering is the community identification algorithm. And we made a, a version that is able to take as input a set of uh, networks organized in a multiplex network. We do that by optimizing the multiplex modularity. And this allows the identifying communities, so sets of nodes tightly linked together, which you can then use for different uh, functional analysis. So to, to see the, the landscape of the functions you have in networks to also do guild by association strategies. So we made different uh, versions of the algorithms and we participated to uh, the dream challenge dedicated to disease module uh, community uh, identification uh, in this context. So I I'm going quick on the community identification because I would like to spend a bit more time on another very interesting and, and very powerful algorithm uh, widely used to study networks and biological networks in particular, which are the uh, random work with retard uh, algorithms. And we also did a version of the random work with restart algorithm that is able to uh, navigate multiplex networks. So uh, briefly, so how uh, the, the principle of the random work with restart algorithm. In this al algorithm, you, you will simulate a particle that is randomly moving, walking into uh, the network. So for instance, you are here, this uh, little head, you're starting a seed, so the seed is very important. It will be your gene or your protein of interest. And at each step, your random particle can randomly move to one of the neighbors. So it can go, for instance, here. And at the following step, it can also randomly move to one of the neighbor. 
And in the special version of the random walk with restart algorithm, you also have a non-zero probability at each time step to go back to the seed. And you see that if you do that a lot, a lot, navigating, going back to the seed, navigating, going back to the seed, you will have some nodes in the network that will be explored a lot because they are close to your seed because, and because they are highly connected. Whereas other nodes, which will be far away from the seed and maybe not have a lot of connection, they will be much less visited. And this is a very nice way to define a proximity score, a score for all the nodes uh, of the networks with respect to the seed, kind of distance or pertinence score for all the network nodes with respect to the seed. So the result here in, in a toy example, I have a toy example here with uh, five nodes. And you can see that if your seed is here, these two nodes are just one jump from the seed. So if you consider, for instance, the shortest path, these two nodes will be exactly the same. Whereas if you use the random walk with restart uh, output score, it will be much more precise. And this node will be more important because it's also more connected, more central in the network. So here it's just a toy example. Um, I just want to mention that I, I show the examples with one seed, but you can have two, three more on any number of seed, and then you will do the restart randomly in any of the seed, and it will be the same. It will be a distance score with all your seeds. And this is a small toy example, but imagine if your seed is lost in a big hairball, in a big network, then this score will allow you to have a score for all the network nodes with respect to your, with your, to your hidden seed. So this is very convenient and widely used uh, to explore networks. And what we did is to, to extend that to allow um, the navigation in a multiplex network. So in this case, uh, you, you explore one layer, but you can also jump from one layer to another because in a multiplex network, the same nodes are present in the different layers. And so doing so, you will be able to um, finally explore the networks, uh, different networks around your seeds, different big networks around your seeds and obtain scores of distances considering multiplex networks with respect to your seeds. Um, so this was the PhD work of uh, Alberto Valde Olivas who graduated uh, two years ago now. And in, in a nutshell, I'd say that, so uh, yeah, and the, the code of course is available on, on GitHub and, and Bioconductor. And so you can access it if, uh, if you need such a tool. And this is very interesting because then when you have your random walk with restart output node score, you can use it for a wide variety uh, of application. You can use it directly for biological applications by prioritizing or ranking your uh, nodes uh, as compared to your seeds. You can also extract subnetworks and you can also use the, the random walk score for other graph algorithms, such as doing clustering, doing network embedding, and I will show some examples of that. Um, so first, I'd like to show a, a kind of use case of how we use this type of network approaches to better understand a genetic uh, disease, a genetic disease. Um, we are really interested in, in this uh, distal and proximal muscular dystrophies. Uh, I'm going to tell you the context. Uh, we focus on dysferinopathies. Dysferinopathies, it's a, a set of uh, diseases arising after mutations in the DISF gene, which is a muscle gene. And it's very peculiar because mutations in the DISF genes gene leads to two main and different onsets. You have part of the patients that have a distal onset, so a myopathy that is affecting uh, the distal muscles of the body, and part of the patient have a proximal onset where uh, the muscle affected are in the central part of the body. So you have a very different distribution of muscle weaknesses arising through mutation in the same gene. And there, there has not been any correlation in between the genotype and the phenotype. You do not have any mutation hotspot, for instance, that could explain these differences. And you even have in the same families where you have the same mutation segregating, you can have both type of onsets. So we really do want to try to understand a bit better how this could be possible. And this is a project led by uh, Osan Özişik, who is postdoc in the team. 
And so to try to see how we can understand that better, the, the first question we asked was scaling up a bit the analysis and trying to focus on the genes that are mutated in other type of myopathies. There are many genes that are mutated that give uh, rise to uh, muscular dystrophies or myopathies. And so we focused on a gene panel that is used for diagnosis. And we have been able to extract 11 genes that are mutated in, in myopathy that are only distal, only distal onset. Um, 19 genes that are mutated in myopathy that have only a proximal onset and seven genes that are associated with both type of onsets and including dysferlin, of course. And doing enrichment analysis, um, we identify that the genes mutated in distal myopathy are enriched in sarcomeric proteins uh, localization. The ones that are mutated in proximal myopathies are um, enriched in sarcolem localization and also all linked manosylation. And the genes that are associated with both type of onsets are annotated for muscle contractions. So it seems here that there is at least like different uh, functions and, and subcellular localization of the genes mutated in these two types of myopathies. Um, extending a bit this analysis, we, we wanted to use our network approach. So we use for inst uh, first the the genes mutated in distal myopathies as seeds in the random work with Restart, exploring three different types of large-scale uh, networks. And we extracted the subnetwork, the top closest nodes to these distal-only genes. And doing so, we, we fetch, um, so the distal-only genes are here in red. And, and during this analysis, we extracted this subnetwork, which contained two genes mutated in uh, myopathy associated to both type of onset. But we do not retrieve genes mutated in proximal myopathies. And the other way is also true. So this style only genes, it's the network I just presented. And if we seed the random walk on proximal um, genes, we also do not fetch distal genes. So it looks like that they might be enriched in different um, subcellular localization uh, proteins and maybe in different subnetworks. So we hypothesize that the genes mutated in these two types of myopathies might be uh, associated to different biological processes, even if both lead to muscle weaknesses, but it might be subtle uh, differences in between the biological processes. And what we want to do now is to try to use this information to um, maybe try to find some modifier genes in the dysferinopathies. So we have for that a data set of uh, exomes for 300 genes. For 26 patients, the, all the patients have a dis, uh, dysferlin causing mutation. So they have a dysferlinopathy, they are diagnosed. But among these 26 patients, we have 15 that have a proximal onset and 11 that have a distal onset. And using the exome data, so we have only 300 genes, but it's a way to start. We were able using a Z test to try to find those variants in, in those other genes that will be associated with one onset and not the other, or at least enrich in one onset as compared to the other. Um, for instance, here, this gene uh, Alpin1 and this variant, it's a non synonymous variant, it's quite frequent in the population. Uh, predicted to be damaging by some of the pathogenicity predictor tools. And this variant is completely absent in, in distal onset patients, but is present in five of the proximal onset patients. And so this is ongoing work, but what we want to do now is take all these candidate modifier genes and try to compute their distances with the um, distal or proximal genes mutated in other types of myopathies to try if maybe we can predict some, uh, yeah, candidate modifier genes with uh, high interest. Um, okay, so this was the uh, ongoing work on, on proximal and, and, and distal myopathies. Um, going back to the main line and, and to uh, other studies we are doing on multi-layer network mining, because we, we based on the random work with retard algorithm, we have different ongoing lines uh, of research. 
Uh, I mentioned here three of these lines and I will detail uh, two of them. Um, so first, uh, Anthony Battista, who is a PhD student in the team, um, he's currently trying to do a, a, an extension of the random work with restart algorithm that will be able to navigate universal multi-layer networks. So networks composed of any number, any type of edges, uh, nodes and, and multiplexes and weighted networks. I, I will show you just after. Um, Leo Pio Lopez, who was a postdoc, and, and some of you know him because he made a, a short stay in the BSC, uh, he developed a method to uh, do uh, embedding to, to project the multi-layer networks or multiplex network into a low dimensional space. And finally, uh, Judith Lambert, so she's also a PhD student, she's building multi-layer networks of patients, so in which the, the, the nodes are the patients and the edges are patients' relationships based on a health questionnaire. And here we have different uh, temporal data. So we are trying to have a, a longitudinal multilayer uh, view to try to study uh, patient uh, health uh, data. Uh, I'm gonna talk a bit about the two first uh, projects today. So first, the universal multilayer networks. The, Networks have been presented before where uh, multiplex networks, so the different layers, they do have the same nodes and just the edges are different. But if you want to integrate more information, more heterogeneous information, you have to extend this framework a bit. And this is the, what we call the universal multilayer network in which you, you have many different types of networks in which the nodes are, are different. So here it's uh, genes, here also, but here it's drugs, here it's disease. The, the nodes are very different. So of course the edges are very different. You can have disease-disease relationships, uh, protein, protein pathway, and so on and so forth. And these different networks are connected by bipartite interactions, meaning interactions in between different types of nodes, such as a gene mutated in a disease. And so with this framework, you can really integrate a lot of um, different types of interactions. But then uh, you have to extend the algorithm to deal with these networks, which are very huge and very complex. And what Anthony did is to adapt the random work with restart to explore universal multilayer networks. So uh, I'm skipping the details on the math and, and numeric implementation. It was not so easy because you have a, a lot of different parameters to, uh, to, to compute the matrices, to navigate in between the different layers and so on. But we now have a, a tool which is called MultiX rank uh, that is in addition very fast and that we hope to make soon uh, available. Um, and that is able yet yeah, to explore and to devise random walk score from these universal multilayer networks. I didn't tell that also, but you can also use uh, weighted networks. So weight your layers, weight, weight your edges and any combination thereof. Important point is how we validate that this uh, algorithm is, is, is working to fetch biological information. Um, Previously, we, we have been working on that using leave one out cross validation. And here we wanted to, to try to have a supervised uh, version of the validation of, of, the, of the random walk. So we are currently building a supervised classifier working in, in this biological multiplex network represented here in a peculiar way where each um, it's a circular plot and each line here is one network and, and the edges represent the bipartite interactions in between the different types of, of networks in the multiplex uh, universal multilayer network. Um, so we computed a, a positive training set where it's all the known gene disease associations from this genet in 2014, a negative training set, which are random gene disease associations. And we use these two data sets to train a classifier with a random forest, for instance. And then we try to test if the method is able to retrieve the new gene disease association that have been uh, uploaded on these genets in between 2014 and 2020. Uh, so it's also still ongoing work. Uh, what we, the first result points to the fact that what is really important is maybe not so much the the number of layers you will have in your different multiplexes, uh, neither the number of multiplexes, but really the quality of the bipartite interactions, the, the quality and coverage of the bipartite interactions. So for instance, the um, 
the first uh, data set we had connecting drugs to genes were not very large, and this seems to impact a lot the results of the, of the random walk with retard capacity to predict new gene disease associations. Um, so it's still ongoing work, and what we will want to do once we will have the methods is to, to try to apply it uh, for, for biological studies. The first application we are aiming is to try to use this uh, universal multi-layer to, to make a pipeline for drug repurposing on rare diseases. So I know that many persons are interested in that and, and doing such experiments. So we would want to try to see how such a combination of networks could help doing that. And we would also like to study um, specifically the, the comorbidities or the genetic association or associations in general in between rare and common diseases. Because something I'm interested for, for many years, like when you have a rare disease such as um, xeroderma pigmentosum, it often has one of the phenotypes can be a common diseases such as in this case, melanoma. And is it coming from because the same genes are involved and can we or can we also find additional relationships that could explain these relationships in between rare and common diseases. And we expect we can do that with the universal multilayer framework because we would be able to integrate um, a disease disease multiplex network composed of different uh, type of disease disease relationships, in particular phenotypic relationships. We will be able to integrate uh, the classical molecular multiplex network we are using for many years now, which has protein-protein interactions, pathways, complexes. And in this molecular multiplex, we can map the genes mutated in rare diseases. But also interestingly, we can integrate a genomic multiplex network, which will be constructed from a promoter capture high C or TAD uh, relationships. And this genomic multiplex that we can connect to the molecular multiplex and to the disease multiplex, we can map the SNPs uh, that belong to genomic region. And so we expect to have all this information together and then to be able to compute distances and find uh, communities or groups that would be close in between some SNPs related to some common diseases and some genes uh, mutated in rare diseases. But still, this is uh, ongoing work. I do not have a uh, a lot of results on, on that uh, from now. Um, okay, second line of research of, on, on multi-layer networks is the embedding. Uh, so you, some of you might know that is a very trendy topic in network science. Uh, do, do we, so how to embed network and, and how to bring new information from network embedding? Uh, the principle of network embedding is just to project your, your network information in a lower dimensional space. And then you can use uh, this low dimensional latent space to do clustering analysis, for instance, but also importantly, to uh, more easily do all the supervised machine learning, uh, apply the toolbox of supervised machine learning. And so what uh, Leo Lopez did is he made a method that can do network embedding from multiplex, but also multiplex heterogeneous networks. So it's a multiplex network that is connected to, uh, for instance, one disease disease network, one network with different types of nodes. So to do so, he's using the random walk with restart uh, scores to compute a probability matrix and, and then um, the verse algorithm, which allows to do uh, the embedding. And he has been evaluating uh, these uh, embeddings with different tasks, such as a clustering, the prediction of new links, uh, node labelings, and so on. And the method is available from uh, GitHub and, and archive. Um, so I will, this concludes uh, the first story I wanted to discuss about. And I will now move to a second story, which is a bit different because we do not integrate information as different network layers, but we integrate information as a network and, and data on nodes and expression data on nodes. But this second story on, on the identification of active modules starts in fact from RNA-seq data. So we all deal a lot with RNA-seq transcriptomics uh, information. And the classical pipeline in this case is you have your transcriptomics data and you try to identify significantly differentially expressed genes in between your different conditions, for instance. 
And once you have these differentially expressed genes, you, you perform usually functional enrichments, trying to find the pathway, the processes that are deregulated uh, in your condition of interest. This can become really frustrating, and in particular when you work on rare diseases and you identify very few differentially expressed genes in your um, low power experiments. And of course, as network biologists, we, we said, can we use biological uh, network information to try to pump up the, this process? The, the idea being to combine transcriptomics data with biological networks to try to find maybe those subnetworks that would contain uh, differentially expressed genes, significant genes, and that could be uh, involved uh, in, in your condition of interest. So it's a way of putting or feeding information in your RNA-seq, uh, biological information in your RNA-seq data. Um, it's, it's not an easy task from a computational uh, point of view because you have to explore a lot of uh, big networks and a lot of different solutions. And, and many persons uh, over the years develop algorithms to, to, do, uh, to try to find those active modules. And the most famous ones are, for instance, uh, Pinnacle Z, which is based on a greedy search, or G Active Module, which is based on, on simulated annealing. And what we observed is that um, all these different methods were usually not considering the density of interaction. So they were trying to find subnetworks, active modules, but just the nodes being connected, not maybe not the nodes being enriched in information. And the method usually used uh, only one and quite often protein-protein uh, interaction network. So in this context, we, we proposed a, a another approach which is based on a multi-objective genetic algorithm to try to identify uh, active modules and this was the phd work of uh, elva Novoa, who graduated uh, last year so we want to do a multi-objective genetic algorithm because we really want to optimize two different objectives we want to optimize the, the scores of the subnetwork, we want to have the subnetwork that has as much as possible nodes with differential expression in the RNA seq data. And so th this will be our first ob objective, the average node score of the subnetwork. And we also want to have subnetwork that maximize the density of interaction. And for that, we compute the normalized density. So considering that we have different uh, network sources, we just normalize the density of the subnetwork across the different network sources. So we really do have uh, these two objectives. And, and the idea yeah, is to try to find those subnetworks that will be very differentially uh, expressed and uh, very dense in interactions. And for that, um, Elva implemented a genetic algorithm, which, is, which are quite fancy genetic uh, algorithms uh, that simulate a kind of evolution. I will, I will detail now. So the multi-objective uh, gen genetic algorithm she adapted um, is NSGA2, which is a classical algorithm, a classical multi-objective genetic algorithm. And she adapted it to be able to deal with uh, network data. So how we do that? We start by uh, generating an initial population of solutions. Our solutions are subnetworks. So we have an initial population of subnetworks that are completely random, taken from uh, a bit everywhere in, in the networks. Then for each solution, we evaluate the solution and rank it thanks to our two objectives. So remember, we really do have two objectives. The first objective is having a high density of interaction computed from the multiplex network. And the second objective is to have a maximum of differential expression computed from the average node score. Each dot here is a solution, meaning it's a subnetwork, and they are organized uh, according to their Pareto front. So the first Pareto front here, it's all the solutions that are not dominated, meaning you have no other solution that is good on the two, at least one of the objectives. And this is a way of, of uh, ranking your population, testing how good they are. So we rank the population, and then in the population you select uh, randomly to parents trying to enrich among the good solutions while preserving also diversity. So you select uh, uh, two parents and then you will combine the parents to generate new solutions. And this is done with crossover. And then you can also introduce some mutations. You add or you remove nodes. And when you do that, you generate a new population of children. So for instance, I have uh, 1,000 
initial population of parents. I combine them randomly and generate also a 1,000 population of children. I also evaluate them, combine both parent and children populations. So I have 2,000 individuals, rank them, and select the best ones. And I can repeat that many, many times until I do not improve a lot the solutions. And so it's a way to explore the full um, set of solutions and combine the solutions to try to improve the fitness of the subnetworks. And you stop that for a certain number of cycles and you just check your final set of solutions. So for instance, the final set of solution will be the, the final first part of France somehow. So for instance, here is one solution. It contains a lot of differentially expressed genes and, and quite dense uh, number of interactions. It's a bit in between, but you can have some solutions here that will have more interactions, but maybe be a but will be less good on the average node score. And here the other way around, you have solutions that are very good on the average node score, but a bit less good in the density of interactions. But at the end of the day, you have a set of solutions that are good according to the different uh, objectives. Um, a tricky point for, for this tool, so it's available on, on Bioconductor and on GitHub, and uh, it's called, we called it uh, Mogamoon. A tricky point is how do we evaluate and compare to other tools? So for that, we devised a benchmark um, in which we, so we selected three methods to compare with, which are very classical methods uh, in the field, COSI, Pinnacle Cell, and G-Active module. And we selected a network and a subnetwork of 20 genes that we will call the foreground genes as compared to all the other nodes, which are the background genes. And we generated artificial expression data uh, for these foreground genes saying that, okay, this is the active module that you have to find. So we have uh, two different scenarios and settings. And so of course there are limitations in this benchmark because um, we do not consider or simulate the fact that it should be in a dense region. We do not consider multiplex network as input and, and we consider only one community or one subnetwork active module to retrieve, whereas we would like to have difference. But the thing is that the other tools, they, they are not able to deal with a multiplex network density and, and more than one subnetwork to identify. So it was also a way to, to compare with the different uh, tools. So it's not a perfect benchmark, but it's what we have. <laughs> And here's a, an example of a result. So it's the plot, each dot is a subnetwork solution. We have its density and average node score. And you can see here all the solutions provided by the different methods. Um, G-active modules and cosine, they provide uh, one solution with a very low density. In fact, it's very big solutions, very big subnetworks uh, with a, a average node score around 0 0.4. Pinnacle Z provides a lot of uh, solutions, a lot of small subnetworks, which are sometimes very good in density and in scores. But in fact, when, when we removed all the subnetworks that have less than 15 nodes, all the small ones, um, we, we saw that Pinnacle Z in fact identify very small, in fact, usually two, three different uh, nodes on in the solutions. So focusing on the subnetworks with at least 15 nodes, uh, we can see that our methods allows to have a set of solutions that cover a bit uh, uh, the space. And, and so I think it's easier to interpret from a biological point of view, uh, subnetworks that are a bit bigger. Uh, we also computed the F1 score to see if the methods can retrieve uh, the foreground genes, the one uh, simulated and, and the F1 score is, is close to zero for all the methods and we are a bit above uh, 0 0.4. Okay, so we were quite happy with Mogamon and we applied it and we are con uh, still continuing to apply it to study uh, different genetic diseases. And here's an example on uh, fasciosclerosis humeral dystrophy, which is another type of uh, myopathies. And this disease is, is really interesting because it has a high genetic complexity. Um, we, we do not have an imitated gene and it seemed that the the disease is caused by a hypomethylation of a repeated genomic region. So we don't have causative genes and we do not understand the pathway that are involved in the, in the disease. And our colleagues, they have arena sick in muscle fibers derived from um, stem cells, from patient stem cells. And using Mogamun, we identify about 20 modules that are really interesting for the pathophysiology of the disease, according to our colleagues. 
such as the one here, where you have uh, down regulations of genes involved in uh, extracellular matrix organization and also an upregulation of uh, wind, which is involved in the development. So we are continuing trying to um, help our colleagues to extract data from their RNA-seq experiments. Okay, so this was my second story on active module identification. And, and then I just have uh, two words on, on uh, recent interest on, on joint dimensionality rejection, which um, it's just we do not use network, but the full matrices. But of course, it's two sides of the same coin. And it's just another uh, way of uh, exploring multiomics data, which is very efficient. So this is done in, in collaboration with uh, Laura Cantini from the uh, from Paris uh, Ebens Institute. And the principle of joint dimensionality rejection is that when you have different omics on the same sample, so they are represented here as the different matrices, you will try to factorize uh, these different omics into one omic specific factor matrix and a second matrix here, F, that you will try to make it being the same in between your different omics, or at least put a lot of constraints so that this matrix F is um, correlated in between your different omics data. And this is very nice because once you have this matrix, you can use it, for instance, for um, clustering samples. And the, the information in this matrix is really coming from your different omics input. So it's really the joint signal from your different uh, omics that you are trying to extract with this method. And you can also use this to, to do some pathway process and molecular mechanisms uh, uh, enrichments. And the thing is that there are many methods existing for, for, um, for doing this matrix factorization to extract joint signal from multiomics data. And so what we did uh, is an extensive uh, benchmark of these uh, matrix factorization approaches. We have uh, nine different matrix factorization approaches. We use simulated data, real cancer data from TCGA and, and single cell data. And we computed the performance of the methods to try to identify clusters, but also to, to associate factors with a survival annotation or clinical metadata. And the same at the single cell level, we try to, to see how the method were good at identifying uh, clusters. And the, this is all available as a Jupyter notebook. So if you have a new matrix factorization method, you can just plug it into the Jupyter notebook and test it against our benchmark or the other way around. If you have a new data set, you can put it in the notebook and test all the methods on these new uh, multiomics data sets. So, uh, we are very uh, enthusiastic about these uh, multiomics integration approaches. Um, the main problem we have now is that these methods, uh, they cannot really apply it on rare diseases when you have very few samples, because uh, you will not be able to identify a lot of factors. So, and, and that's why I have an empty slide here, and because it's part of the project we want to develop, how we can do joint dimensionality reduction or matrix factorization uh, in rare diseases. And we have different ideas uh, related to that based, uh, for instance, on transfer learning and learning the factors on, on big public compendium and trying to transfer the information for all rare diseases. And with that, I'm done. I'd like to thank all the people from the team involved in the different studies and, and, and the collaborators from my lab, uh, from the Mathematic Institutes, uh, with whom I'm, I'm working for a long time, uh, Laura in Paris, and of course, uh, you at the BHC and, and Alfonso um, team and department. And thank you all for your attention. Nice. Uh, nice. uh, so time for questions. If you have any question, please just un unmute yourself and ask, of course. I have a question, uh, Nice. Yeah. Okay, uh, David here. Uh, thank you for the presentation, it was amazing. Uh, so I have uh, two questions. One is uh, related to the uh, this this um, myopathies. Yeah, it looks and like your work on uh, congenital myosthenia. Yes, yes, it's true. Yeah, it's, that's another uh, that's another one. <laughs> it's true. No, it, it was more more uh, of a curiosity actually because uh, it is known that uh, in uh, in motor neurons uh, the you know it's I mean it, 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 an important role is played by RNA trafficking and uh, in many of those diseases uh, uh, the the transportation of uh, those 
transcripts along the axons towards the synapses where they are uh, translated is actually important. And so like, it's fascinating to me this difference now of the proximal and distal, distal uh, muscles. So I was wondering whether those two groups of genes that you identified, the proximal and distal genes, if the transcripts that they code have some uh, properties uh, that can affect uh, their trafficking, like for instance, the stability, uh, length, uh, the affinity to specific uh, uh, RNA binding products that are involved in this process. Um, I think it's a very interesting hypothesis, but it will mean that we would need to maybe take data not from muscles here, because the hypothesis will be like when you are close to the central body of the neuron, you are less affected than when you are far away. And I'm not sure we will find this information uh, studying uh, muscle cells directly, because it would be more the neuromuscular connection that would be impacted. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a good hypothesis. Uh, I'm not sure we can enter it with the data we have. Because the data we have, of course, you cannot sample patients in these diseases. So mm. what we are, we are usually doing, at least for RNA-seq data, um, is using IPS. So you, you take your patient fibroblast, you make IPS, and then you re muscle cells uh, mm. from that. So you can derive muscle cells with patients from distal and proximal phenotypes and trust to study the RNA expression differences. I don't have this uh, data, and, and, but I think it could be a good uh, hypothesis. I would, yeah, I would like to have rna data on the two onsets uh, mm. from the, this mm. patient. For now, I just have exons on 300 genes. So it's very... Um, very small data set. Small, but yeah. yeah, the neuromuscular connection uh, hypothesis is a good idea because, of course, you are far away from neurons. Um, yeah, and then, like, the ones of the, I mean, those are very long uh, axons, no? And mm. so, like, what is happening during the journey, you know, it's, uh, mm. this is the, the question. So, um, okay. And then the, the second question is about the validation of uh, multi X rank using uh, yeah. this genet. Okay, can you unmute yourself? Like, okay, thank you. <laughs> so, basically, like, uh, 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 like a, a known issue of working with historical data comparison is that uh, uh, generally, you know, uh, across the years, the biological annotation uh, uh, change a lot. So some are revised, some are dropped. Uh, and so like if you are comparing a network, with, even from the same source, but a network uh, uh, constructed with 2014 data and one constructed with 2012 data, I mean, it's really difficult to to yeah. compare. So I, I was wondering what, what was your strategy here? Maybe like, I don't know, like discarding the edges that changes along the years or something like that? So here, uh, the, the network, um, let's say the, the networks connecting the same uh, nodes uh, are, do not evolve, meaning I have the same PPI, I, I keep the same PPI, the same molecular complex and so on. What is mm. moving uh, is the bipartite interaction. So in fact, we select the positive training sets from this genet 2014. So it would correspond to the bipartite interactions in between the disease network and the PPI. And, and, and so it's only on this annotation that I make uh, that, uh, yeah, that Anthony yeah. is making the the switch, uh, how to say that, uh, the, the networks are remaining the same. What, so biological in, information is remaining the same. What is moving is just, can we predict more bipartite interactions? Um, so I'm not sure I'm answering correctly. I know what you mean, and I'm not sure I'm answering it correctly. It's, uh, uh, we do not change protein-protein interaction, for instance. So we I just see. try to see if I, I take a given network and I try to train it, can I predict new interaction? But I do not change the biological information. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, so it's we, we can also test, and, and something uh, we will discuss with Anthony, we can also test with classical, we'll leave one out. But uh, I like this idea of uh, historical data because really we try to see if given a network, we can predict new information. And also the second challenge here was to see uh, how we can do supervised learning with a network. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, more questions? Uh, okay, uh, there is one question in the chat also. Uh, so Felicia asks if you have also worked with Alzheimer's or other type of, of dementia, any kind of disease like this? So, 
working a bit in, in, in cancer, and so I work with, uh, with uh, Alfonso also uh, on common diseases and on cancer. We still have some projects, but I really try to focus on rare diseases for, for a few years now. Uh, because I'm in a genetic in a rare disease genetic institute, and also because we have already a lot of to do, uh, but I do think that uh, there are some relationship. Because finally, the challenges and questions we ask for rare diseases it's quite similar to the question you would ask if you want to have a stratified uh, medicine point of view on common diseases. So, I never never worked with that, but some of the challenges are similar. Mm. Okay. Uh, more questions. Yeah, I have a question. I have a question. It's maybe it's a naive question, but I don't know how you determine the distance between nodes in a layer. How you say this gene or yes, this gene, for example, is far away related to another. So to this goal, we really do use the random walk with restart score because when you compute, so you have a seed, you, you, you compute your, your different walks and at, at the end of the day, it's a probability distribution. And, and so it's really, uh, the, it, it's a measure of the distances, but it's just not the number of shortest paths, the number of jumps, it really takes the full topology into account. And this can be seen as a measure of distance. So this 0 0.25 is the distance between this node and this seed. And so you have like that a distance and you can use it as a distance measure. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, hi, I have, I have some questions, it's possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so hi, thank you very much for your talk. Um, so in the part of the Mohamun, where you try mm -hmm. to find this active node, yeah, can you go to the slide please? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm trying to find it. Uh, so this one, the genetic algorithm? Uh, no, the previous one, I think. On the or even the previous one, where you show like the density or or, or the forward one. Well, this you show one. Mm -hmm. here, yeah, yeah. So the point is that uh, I mean I think it's something that is really interesting. Uh, and but here, I mean, what you show is that you try to maximize these two parameters, right? The mm -hmm. the node score and then the density, and you show that you have these kind of optimal solutions here in in black, right? Yeah, so, the first part of front. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what what I'm like what I'm I'm saying is like if if you check if you know because here what you have is that some of them have like a, a high number for one of the parameters here in the top left and in the bottom right you have like possible solution too but for the the other way around so have you check if if in terms of biological functional interpretation of these different solutions you have like different changes. You know, yeah, it's, I, it's not the same solutions. Yeah, so exactly. quite often they do overlap. Yeah, you have at least two, three nodes in common, but mm -hmm. it's, not, uh, it's not the same solution. It's not the same subnetworks. Yeah, so, uh, so, so it depends on the data, but... Uh, and so it's really providing, and, and it's why I think it's interesting to have two mm -hmm. different objectives because you cannot really choose uh, in between. Uh, I want a lot of interactions, but yeah. I don't care about uh, differential expression or the other way around. So finally, uh, when you apply Mogamun, usually you obtain around uh, 20 solutions. And, and then we explore the solutions with the biologist and, and they will jump on what is the most interesting for them. But I think it's interesting to have this set of solutions, even if it's overlapping as compared to have one big network that would contain 200 nodes and that you don't really know what to do with it. Yeah, yeah I, I really think it's, it's the point of this. It's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what I really loved about that is the the genetic algorithm when you are trained in biology it was really interesting to see uh, the evolution of the solutions like that and you do crossover and mutations and it's really really fun <laughs> so specifically when you try this to apply this this method to your data i mean to the this facio scapulo muscular dystrophy or, or yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good so what you what you observe in, in this in this in this line i mean on the different solutions you find like overlap in your case or not yeah yeah, these different solutions have overlap. So for instance, genes that will be highly connected and highly differentially expressed, they, they quite often pop up in the solutions. So we have, in this case, we have 23, uh, in this data set, we have 23 modules. Uh, and, and what we do is we, we discuss with the biologists and, and, and they quite easily jump on what they are interested in from that. So, and, and the solutions, so we also, 
take into consideration what are the edges and we tell to them, okay, if you have edges that are coming from pathway database, you can give a bit more trust that edges that are coming from co-expression and so on. So of course you still have to do post filtering of your solutions. We also take the set of nodes and do some functional enrichment to, to give a broad uh, row annotation to, to the module. Of course, you still have work. It's not final set of solution, but it, it helped exploring data set that in this case have few differentially expressed genes when you study them only from RNA seq data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Okay, yeah, I have uh, another question. So, first, thanks a lot for the presentation. It was super interesting. Uh, about the integration of multiomics data on rare disease. So, you this said one? you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so very interesting. Yeah. And um, uh, I was wondering, uh, so could you use actually uh, so multi-layer uh, networks? Because you said you could use them for rare disease and then somehow use uh, some uh, embedding to learn some factors. And yeah. if your method is explainable, then you could retrieve uh, information. Yeah, exactly. So in, in fact, uh, in, in the project we submitted to do a uh, um, multiomics integration approaches for rare diseases, we really have two sets of approach. One is one based on networks, because networks are very good to handle uh, missing data. So mm -hmm. of course, we will we, we, we are applying all the network-based data integration for, for rare diseases too. Uh, just matrix factorization is, is, is giving a kind of different type of output, which is also interesting. And so we want to have both, but of course we will do a multi-layer network integration to study rare diseases. It's, in fact, it's, on, it's what we are doing already when we have uh, this type of networks where we can explore uh, around uh, rare disease genes. And this is what we are doing a lot already. Okay, and the method to embed the networks, are they um, very well explainable? And can you learn biological? This is a tricky mm -hmm. point. So everybody is doing network embedding for a while now. I don't know if you assist to ISMB last summer. It was quite impressive. Um, I think what I'm missing a bit is a really a deep comparison of what you will learn from the embedding as compared to what you would learn directly from heat diffusion or random work on the on the raw network. And, and maybe I missed that, but I, I'm not sure there is a, a study that is doing the full comparison of what is added from the embedding. It's a reduction of dimension. So it could be interesting to really extract the, the core or the juice of your data. Uh, but I think we would need a proper benchmark to, to do that to, to be sure of that for biology. And, and it's not so easy because we don't have uh, gold standards. So I think nobody is trying to do that. Uh, but it's, um, it's really an interesting question. And, and at least for, so the method we, uh, we did, we, uh, Leo did is, is really, it is tested on not only on biological networks, but it's tested, tested with tools such as link prediction and so on. So it mm -hmm. seems to, 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 to work for that, but we did not do the comparison with just using uh, diffusion or, or network algorithm. I think it's interesting. Um, a lot of people are interested in that. Um, so we will see in the close future what the added value of all that. What is really, uh, yeah, the good idea is that when you have your, your embedded space, you can really apply the full toolbox of machine learning very easily, yeah. which is not so easy when you work on, on the network. You have to trick it, so. Okay, thanks for that. Okay, more questions? Nice, uh, good morning and thanks for the talk. Uh, now that we have uh, you here, uh, on the on the on the, the multi layers, uh, you know, what would you say that are the the key things missing? Uh, in ex, in ex <laughs> today? Because otherwise, that we end up. Uh, 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 so key things missing. Uh, key things missing is in the application of the of the of the multi layers. Uh, so what not on the data the, sources, more on how to apply that. In the algorithmic, the you know the weights, the the traversing between the the, the networks, the, the missing values, the incompleteness of the of the how to, to, to apply this when data data is incomplete. I know the, I, I see many. It's very interesting, and you know, uh, David and Nick are putting uh, substantial effort on your side, but you you are more advanced. So, uh, 
what, what would you say are the, the key things missing? Because uh, I can imagine a number of that you, you have a better overview. So, I don't know. The, the, the thing is that I, I think we are plateauing always, uh, but in bioinformatics in general, like we have 70% of good predictions whatsoever we do. Uh, so, but I, I'm not sure if it's coming from the algorithm or from the data sources. From the algorithmic side, uh, the physics community is working a lot in, in making the algorithms for working on multiplex uh, multi-layer networks. I think what is missing now is that we, we still do not have a proper way to benchmark what we find uh, in network biology. And, and so, okay, we find communities, but how good there are those communities, we don't know because we don't have ground truth. And I think it's always the missing point here. And each time we do an algorithm, the reviewers are not happy with the evaluation, but we, we never have very good way to evaluate what we find. So for me, it's <laughs> the, the toughest part is, is there. And, and in, it was the, the case in this uh, dream challenge paper, which was, uh, uh, I don't remember where I have it, on the community identification uh, um, paper, because, oh, where is it? Ah, oh, here. So they tried to do a, a proper benchmark, but finally it's, it's uh, very frustrating because their benchmark is to try to see if uh, the, the communities you find, they are enriched in, in GWAS hits. Uh, so it's always a proxy. It's not the reality. So yeah, for me, the most frustrating part is that we cannot really test uh, the performance of the algorithms. I mean, I know what, uh, it's already late. So, uh, but um, of the of the things that I'm uh, I'm worried is that the different layers. I want to, to hear your opinion. Um, in reality, they are not independent because they are all of them associated uh, casual, you know, uh, by casual uh, reasons at the biological level. No, the expression. Yeah, but that the is protein, the protein with the pathway, the pathway with the. With the but that is important. They have not to be independent, and it's something that we show in, in this dream challenge paper because they, they gave us uh, anonymous network, and so we were trying to do community identification from different anonymous network, and it was not working well. But then when they disclosed what was the network data, uh, it was epistatic interaction, protein interaction, and 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 so it's it's not the same biological signal. So for me. For the multi-layer need to be complementary, but also needs to arise from the same biological signal. But at the same time, we are not weighting them according to the type of biological relations between them. You can do that. Uh, you can do that if you have the information, but then it's even worse when you want to evaluate because how to weight, you're, you're not completely mm -hmm. sure. Right, right, right. <laughs> so we say it's difficult to take into account what we know that there is a relation at the biological level because we don't know how to express it properly. And mm. if we express it, we don't know how to evaluate the results. Yeah. Very mm. interesting additional weight. Uh, so um, at least on the community identification, the, the, from a mathematical point of view, the idea is to see, okay, we have a true community structure that is hidden and that we don't know. And the different biological networks are different realizations of the true biological structure. And we try to expect to find the signal together. At least if it's, uh, the way uh, my mathematician colleague were expressing this idea of finding joint community structure from from different networks, uh, but this is not true for all networks. If if you if you have the full uh, this network, we do not expect to find a joint community structure. Uh, one more, one one more uh, abuse of your uh, uh, time. Um, what are the applications, or oh, does it work better in, the, in terms of oh, this type of problems, validation and uh, relations between the layers in other areas that are not biology? So it's the, for community identification, it was the conclusion from the, uh, our physicist colleagues that, uh, so they said that multi-layer in this setting was uh, not bringing a lot of information. Um, so for me, it was because the networks were too different and the settings were a bit complex in the evaluation. But some colleagues from the physics community, they say, okay, it's just it doesn't work on, on, on biological networks, uh, which I'm, I'm not completely sure. But they do have uh, different training sets. And in fact, we are, uh, Anthony is evaluating uh, 
what we are doing on, on this multi-layer network, he's evaluating that also on non-biological networks. So he has networks of airports connections and flights between airports in different countries and different companies. So you have uh, the country multi-layer with the different companies and, and how the companies are connected. So it's a small data set in which you can really interpret the results. And I'm not sure it's so different uh, from one type of networks to another. Because in this case, the validation will be easier. Yeah. You can just Obviously, go to the no, airport. Because in Europe, yeah, it is. Exactly. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's what I was asking you. What are the applications? But still, the, the validation is a bit uh, complex. So the, the widely used uh, network for clustering algorithm is the Karate Club network. So they, they have the cluster you have to find. But it's a very rare case of where you know the clusters. And right. everybody is testing this Karate Club data sets uh, on the algorithm, but it's very small and it's not. Uh, yeah, we will have, we, we have no choice but using proxies for the evaluations. Yeah, uh, talking, one more, talking about uh, proxies and I think it was asked before, uh, is uh, using DigiNet a good proxy for evaluating the the thing that I, I still, um, the work is not advanced enough for me to know the bias in, in comparing this genet 2014 to this genet 2020. So for instance, if we can imagine that uh, uh, they released a big data set that is coming only from GWAS or this kind of thing, we might have a lot of bias in, in that. And, and so it might not be the only way to evaluate that, but I, I was thinking this historical validation is really you, you, you try to predict the future and we have a way to validate. So it's not so bad. Leave one out cross validation is interesting also. Uh, I think it's very complementary. I think we have to try both. And, and, but what else, uh, what else can we do to try if it works? No, 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 no that, that, that's true. I'm just asking mm. exactly what you say, the heterogeneity of the data set that are used for building the, the, the data set, the database is pretty big and some of the data and, and the quality is uh, very variable mm. of the different data sets. So, I think we are back to this problem of you may need to choose from these uh, relations the only new, mm -hmm. like in your, in your data set, only the one that are, you know, what you said, you know, you start using the Tochiwa's data, it may make it very confusing, for example. Yeah, and it might be. A, sure that the relations mm -hmm. are the So that's my question, is more in this direction. You have to try to, to decide what part of uh, this unit would be. Yeah. I, we, we made a selection on the scores uh, provided by this genet. We do not take the full data sets. Uh, we made the selection on the scores given their advice, their guideline. But then the scores change in between 2014 and 2020. So, <laughs> in any case, here the, the idea of the comparison is not to do an absolute evaluation, it's also to compare uh, what it brings to add network layers. So if, if we compare in this setting, mm -hmm. it's uh, less of a problem. Yeah. We, we do not say yeah. like, okay, the method is, is perfect in, in an absolute way. It's just like, okay, bipartite interactions are necessary. Uh, if you add drug layers, you bring information and, and it's more doing that, the in, yeah, internal comparisons. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, sorry, uh, talking talking about this, like uh, the, the interpretation and new challenges, uh, I was wondering whether all those frameworks uh, could work on uh, uh, knowledge graphs as well. So basically like a multi-layer or of directed uh, graphs in which you have like semantics associated to the edges. And uh, imagine that those layer comes from different uh, corpora, for instance, or uh, ontologies. Uh, so, I mean, this, like applying this, uh, all this, but like extracting something that is actually like meaningful and like uh, intelligible for human. Yeah, that's a good idea. I, I'm I, I very poor knowledge of the field of uh, knowledge learning and so on, but it's I, I think they do have some algorithms to explore the graphs. So maybe they are doing that. I have no idea. I don't know the field, but I think, yeah, mm. it sounds uh, reasonable. Mm. Okay, so it's so, so for instance, like the uh, RWR, I mean, it works also on directed graphs. Basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Okay. The, the new so, version, uh, multi-strength, you can have weighted, uh, you can weight the layers, you can weight the, the nodes, you can, you, you can do whatever you want. It's really versatile uh, from a matrix point of view. Okay, so, okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, couple questions more. Mm. I think somebody raised uh, his hand. I don't know if you can see that, Iker. Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> Okay. Oh, uh, go. Go. Uh, because I, I don't see it. In the the I don't see it. <laughs> yeah, so this is a question about uh, Mocha Moon. Yeah. So, so I was wondering if it is possible to use it or extend it with uh, weighted edges, and if that uh, would even be useful. Let me think. Uh, the thing is that. Yeah, you could imagine having a, uh, an objective that could take into account the, the weights of the edges. So you just have to change a bit this formula and it should not be a problem. Then the thing is that how you evaluate what it brings. <laughs> so it's again, uh, but yeah, it should not be a problem to weight. To weight either the different layers because you have a normalized density. So you can imagine, okay, I have PPI, I want it to count twice as a, as a co-expression, but or to weight the edges inside. If, as long as you define this for this objective to take that into account, so it's not a problem. Okay, thank you. Okay, there is one more question in the chat, I think, from Nuria Keral. I don't know if she, I don't think she, she asked you. Uh, so she asked, uh, what about the interpretability of your predictions? If the, uh, the algorithms that you are presenting providing, uh, pro uh, are, pro are providing explanations for scientists to, to interpret. So it, it, it's uh, it's uh, computational biology. So meaning that we we indeed do predictions. It's not uh, uh, ground truth. Uh, so it, it's also the interesting point of being in a, in a genetic lab for two years is because we are really trying to work with the biologists to interpret, and and try to help them interpret what we are doing. Um, in some cases, we also tried uh, some validation. So we we had one which uh, was not working with predicted. Uh, a gene that could be of interest for DNA repair and premature aging in, in uh, using a random work, but uh, the, the valid, the, when knocking out of the genes was not doing anything. So it's not also always working. So we were not lucky in this time, in this step. So yeah, it's, I, I think it still um, requires to have a collaboration in between the biologists and the bioinformatician. We cannot just give them the results and, and they would be lost uh, and the clinicians also. So, yeah, in the context of a collaboration, we, we are making some progress and, and after, and our colleagues, they see us for two years now, so they are getting a bit used about what we are talking about. And so I think in the next, I'm really hoping uh, to improve collaborations in, in the next future. Yeah. Then I think we can leave it here. I also have a couple more questions of my own, but I, I can leave it for- Yeah, we will for, discuss this afternoon. Yeah. Uh, so we are running up, out of time. So thank you, Anais. Thank you all for being part of You're the presentation. Welcome. And see you in the next uh, department seminar. Bye-bye. Thank you, Anais. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.